Hey everybody, we are not doing the Wednesday Easy Chair Chat as you can see. It's actually a Tuesday night and instead of our home in Mechanicsville, we are at my dad's home in Canton, Ohio, where I had denominational meetings and we were able to see family while we were up here in Canton. So that's been very blessed. But we don't want to share our uh, chat with you, just some thoughts. I'm finishing up the Book of Ruth, as you are aware. And so tonight I finish it. So let me read from verse 13 to the end of the chapter. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him the name, a name saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They called him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Okay, so we see in this passage that uh, Ruth had been barren with her first husband, Malon, but God gave her the ability to conceive, and children are a blessing from the Lord. And so that's why we evangelical Christians are pro-life. We believe that life is sacred. It begins in the womb and should be protected. The women of the community bless Naomi. God has given her an heir. And they give a blessing to her that he would be famous, and actually her grandson will be. They call this child, and I thought it was interesting, Redeemer in that translation, or Kinsman Redeemer in the other translation, that, that he would take care of her in her old age. They also give another tribute to Ruth, that she is better than seven sons, and that is high praise. Then it says that Naomi laid him on her lap, and that could mean maybe two different things. One is just a grandmother's care for him, as, as a grandma would delight in her grandson. But the other meaning is that she formally adopted him, and he became her son, and that Boaz and Ruth merely raised him. His name Obed means one who serves, and he did serve his, his uh, grandmother Naomi. Now I want to finish the text. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. Okay, so this genealogy is how the book concludes, and it's pointing to David. It starts with Perez and gives 10 generations, so that's about 600 years. So there's some generations that were skipped there, but they wanted to make it 10. Genealogies reminds us of God's providence, that God's in control all along, even starting with Perez, who was a son of Tamar and Judah, which led to David. This is the reason for the book of Ruth. It's a book about David. The writer, probably who lived in, in David's day, wanted to honor him and speak about his Moabite roots. And so David's name is the last name of the book. It's, it's the beginning of the book and it's the end of the book. The book of Ruth really is about David's line, David the king. In fact, he points out David's Moabite roots and there is a passage uh, in 1 Samuel where when David was on the run from Saul, he took his parents and took them to the king of Moab and asked him to protect them, and he did. Now, I want to finish up by reading some scripture and how the book of Ruth serves as a beautiful type and shadow of the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus as our kinsman redeemer and that salvation for all comes through him. Galatians 4, 4-5. 
But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that they might receive the full rights of sons. And Philippians 2, 5 to 7. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Ephesians 2, 12 to 14. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world, like Ruth. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall, of hostility. And lastly, Galatians 3, 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There may be overlap in this. This would be, I called it voluntarily, but the willingness of Jesus. I know that David, even though the temple wasn't built under him, he was so blessed when he saw that people willingly gave of their own treasures for the building of the temple. And the aspect that was so wonderful was they willingly gave. They were cheerful givers. Quoting Spurgeon again, he says, you can spot a cheerful giver because they always wish they could give even more than they're giving. Well, I think as far as affections, when you ask somebody why they love Jesus, it usually comes to, he died on the cross for me. And if we were even to break this down into more intricacy, does it matter Jesus' willingness to die? Was it more obedience? Or was it more that he really wanted to? I think when you come into these areas of affection, it actually is important that he wanted to. So I think uh, author McLaurin divided John 16, 28 into four parts of Jesus' existence, like the whole Christ. And we realize that he is going to show integrity and willingness in each part. So if we could just notice as some scriptures are re read, the words want, will, willingly. Okay, so it breaks down four of these. Eternal dwelling with the Father, His voluntarily coming to earth, His voluntary departing earth, and then once again to return to the Father. So the verse itself reads, I came I came from out of the Father and have come into the world. Now I am leaving the world and I'm going into I'm going to the Father. Four parts. So first of all, he says, I came out from the Father. In to out. This participation the Son had with the Father is like too deep for us to even realize. Um, John writes, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side or in the Father's bosom has made him known. If you were in the Father's bosom, could you ever willingly leave? So some verses, no man has ascended into heaven except the one who came down from heaven. I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Before Abraham was, I am. You know, as I think about that, I think, was Jesus in the bosom of the Father, and he watched Abraham lead his life, and maybe even had a few encounters with Abraham. 
What if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? That's John 6, 62. And then lastly, in John 17, when he's praying, Glorify me with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So this most heightened place, he had glory with the Father. And again, he willingly would leave. You know, as I hear and, and things get into me more to picture Jesus with the Father, it's almost as if glue is happening. There's more in me that has affections attached to what is above. I don't think it's a mistake to listen to these things. Okay, second part, he came to earth. So second part of the verse, 1628, again, I came out from the Father and I have come into the earth. So this is the part of that. Well, he left and he came to his own and the, his own received him not. So that's not real rewarding right away. He appeared here, he was found as a man, and then it also says, but a body thou hast prepared for me. So the Holy Word willed to be born and that his holy life would be given a body. Again, the voluntary aspect. I, I heard a counselor one time speak about people with attachment issues, which maybe many people do to some degree. But as far as the counselor, what they would try to convince the person was, I want to be with you. And that's what Jesus is wanting us convinced of. He wanted to be with us. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. Even though this might take a moment, this quote is so wonderful about this point in time where Jesus is making this decision. In the form of God, he stands on the lofty level before the descent begins and in spirit makes the surrender which stage by stage is afterwards to be wrought out in act. Before any of these acts, there must have been the disposition of mind and will, which Paul describes as counting it not a thing to be grasped, to be on equality with God. He did not regard the being equal with God as a prey or treasure to be clutched and retained at all hazards, that sweeps our thoughts into the dim regions far beyond even Calvary and Bethlehem and is a more overwhelming manifestation of love than are the acts of lowly gentleness and patient endurance which followed in time. It included and transcended them all. What could do this but infinite love? To rescue men and win them to himself and goodness and finally, to lift them to the place from which he came down from them. That means you and me going up where he came down from. Seemed to him to be worth the temporary surrender of that glory and majesty. We can but bow and adore the perfect love. We look more deeply into the depths of deity than unaided eyes could ever penetrate. And what we see is the movement in that abyss of Godhead of purest surrender. So we go on. Jesus was willing to take on a, a human form here. And one writer very insightfully says from um, John 13, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God, and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, taking a towel, and tied it around his waist. So he had already wrapped humanity around his holiness. Now in further servants, servitude, he was wrapping a towel. Okay. Loved me and gave himself for me. Now we're talking about the cross. Galatians 2.20 ends with that. 
So if we would meditate on that, he loved me and gave himself for me. It does not sound like he had to. An another quote. Ah, freely gave himself up to death for us all. That divine surrender the apostle ventures in another passage to find dimly suggested from the far, and so he's going to talk about Abraham, almost in the form of God, yielding up Isaac, being like how we think of God, but they thought, he, this writer says, too often that's one-sided. The whole doctrine of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ has been marred by one-sided insisting on the truth that God sent his son to the forgetting of the fact that the son came, that he emptied himself, and he bound himself to the cross with the cords of love and bands of men and died with no natural necessity nor from any imposition of the divine will upon him unwilling, but because he would, and that he would because he loved. Okay, then we know that Jesus, the way he died and then the way he was going to take up his life again was his choice as well. He says in John 10, For this reason, and he's talking about, I lay down my life for the sheep. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. So his own accord, Jesus totally willingly laid it down. He says, no greater man has loved than this. He lay down, lays down his life for his friends. Okay, the actual departing then was him saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is finished. Another quote. The fact is that Jesus Christ is the Lord of death and was so even when he seemed to be its servant, that he never showed himself more completely the prince of life and the conqueror of death than when he gave up his life and died, not because he must, but because he would. Okay, so we just read, I have authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my father. So he by his willingness and authority, took it up again and was raised. And interesting that the person almost thought it's like inverted gravity. Other people needed an angel, a whirlwind, a chariot. Jesus, it was his natural habitat to, to go up. And then the disciples, having seen him go up, had such joy. And here we are. He has gone up. We weren't there at the ascension. But the sense that he has returned to the Father raises our affections. If you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your hand, mind on things that are above, not on things on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Is there enough that's being said that there's something in our affections that is starting to go there? And lastly, I just want to point out the wonderful verse in Hebrews that says in Hebrews 4.14 that since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, we can now say the Christ I know has gone, has passed through the heavens. I know the one who has passed through the heavens. Look up then, like they did at the ascension, somewhere up there is a true body. Our true high priest has passed through, quote, then the far off becomes near, the vague becomes definite, the unsubstantial becomes solid, and what was fear becomes a joy. Faith has uncovered a willing God. Thank you. All right. I'd like to pray for you. Lord, pray that uh, the, these words that point to Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done, would speak into every heart, and that you would draw us to you, closer to you, deeper into you, in Jesus' name.
Amen. God bless you.